The following is distributed by the Berean Call. Chapter 6. Roots of Seduction Beloved, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude, verse 3. It requires a little insight to realize that in order to establish Antichrist's official world religion in the space age, where science is worshipped, it will be necessary to merge religion with science. Many secular leaders have been predicting this for some time. Catholic priest paleontologist Tihar de Chardin and psychologist C.G. Young both foresaw it. This process is already well established, not only in the secular world, but also within the church. One place where science and religion have met is in the growing practice of hypnosis. Though an integral part of occultism for thousands of years, hypnosis has now been accepted as scientific and is even being used by hundreds of Christian psychologists. The following statement by two of the leading authorities in the field of hypnosis, William Kroger and William Fesler, should give everyone who uses any form of hypnosis, especially Christians, serious concern. Quote, the reader should not be confused by the supposed differences between hypnosis, Zen, yoga, and other Eastern healing methodologies. Although the ritual for each differs, they are fundamentally the same. End of quote. More and more Christian psychologists use hypnosis to regress clients back into their childhood or even into the womb in order to deal with early traumas. Factual data often come forth, even though the brain of the prenatal, natal, and early postnatal infant is not sufficiently developed to carry memories. The source of these memories is therefore suspect at best. This is equally true of the memories often aroused in what Christians call inner healing or healing of the memories, which can be a form of hypnosis and will be dealt with later. However, some of Bernard Diamond's comments about suggestion and memory should be noted now. A professor of law and clinical psychiatry, he's one of the world's leading authorities on hypnosis. Among the questions Dr. Diamond answered in the California Law Review were the following. Quote, can a hypnotist, through the exercise of skill and attention, avoid implanting suggestions in the mind of the hypnotized subject? No, such suggestions cannot be avoided. During or after hypnosis, can the hypnotist or the subject himself sort out fact from fantasy in the recall? Again, the answer is no. No one, regardless of experience, can verify the accuracy of the hypnotically enhanced memory. End of quote. Nevertheless, in the name of science, hypnosis is being called upon increasingly to support psychology's religious beliefs in such things as infinite potential residing in the subconscious and the conscious direction of humanity's evolution to a so called higher consciousness involving godlike mind powers and lately even reincarnation. Psychiatrists are now regressing patients under hypnosis back through the womb to experience alleged prior lives. Clearly, such memories do not come from the brain, but from the same seductive source as prenatal memories. Even factual memories of the future surface under hypnosis. In one study involving 6,000 hypnotically regressed subjects, about 20% experienced earlier existences on other planets. Evolution plays an extremely important part in the merger of so-called science with religion. Evolution is a theory that did not originate with science, but has been at the heart of the occult for thousands of years. Hinduism, with its evil caste system, is based upon a cosmic evolution to godhood that works through karma and reincarnation. The growing acceptance of these ideas in Western society is illustrated by the following ad in the Sunday calendar section of the Los Angeles Times. Quote, Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi, the most important spiritual figure in the world today, she will awaken in you the force that will change your life and change the world. This awakening explains and integrates all the great religions. 
It grants inner peace, health, and joy. It is the last evolutionary step promised by traditions that stretch back to the beginnings of human spiritual awareness. First United Methodist Church of Hollywood. This is science. Some psychiatrists are even regressing their patients back into earlier forms of life in order to recall the deeper memories of their experiences as apes, salamanders, or polywogs. Gene Houston, who has PhDs in both religion and psychology, conducts workshops in which he leads participants to awaken these ancient memories. The following excerpt from a reporter's account of one session indicates the type of delusion that has become commonplace among educated people who consider themselves too sophisticated to believe in sin, repentance, and forgiveness through the sacrifice of a crucified and resurrected, not reincarnated, Jesus. Quote, Remember when you were a fish, Houston suggested in Sacramento. Nearly a thousand people dropped to the floor and began moving their fins as if to propel themselves through water. Notice your perceptions as you roll like a fish. How does your world look, feel, sound, smell, taste? Then you came up on land, Houston recalled, taking us through the amphibian stage. Then Houston suggested, allow yourself to fully remember being a reptile. Then some of you flew, others climbed trees. We became a zoo of sounds and movements made by early mammals, monkeys, and apes. Houston then called us to remember being the early human who loses his, her, protective furry covering and evolves into the modern human. The climax of the already intense exercise that had taken us more than an hour followed. Now I want you to extend yourselves even further into the next stage of your own evolution. We became a room of leaping, joyous, sometimes alone, often together human beings who eventually joined hands and voices. The impact was electric. We had become a wiggling sea of bodies, nearly a thousand housewives, therapists, artists, social workers, clergy, educators, health professionals, who had crawled over and under each other, enjoying ourselves and relearning what was deep within our memories. Following encouragement by her close friend, Margaret Mead, Jean Houston organized a symposium for leading U.S. government policymakers entitled The Possible Society, an Exploration of Practical Policy Alternatives for the Decade Ahead. Houston tells how she guided about 150 extremely high-ranking government officials for about three days. We had these officials on the floor, guiding them into internal journeys, looking for the possible society. With examples such as this multiplying in the name of science, the biblical prophecies about deception and delusion just prior to Christ's return are becoming more believable and understandable each day. There is a deep need in the human heart for purpose and meaning. If this is not satisfied in a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, the soul will seemingly grasp at any straw, no matter how flimsy or bizarre. Teilhard de Chardin, architect of apostasy. No person has contributed more to the merger of science and religion than the French priest paleontologist Teilhard de Chardin. Treated as an apostate by the Vatican, banned from teaching, and forbidden to publish his writings, the controversial Jesuit, who was known as the father of the New Age, became a hero of sophisticated Protestants and then returned to the good graces of Rome 26 years after his death in 1955. Teilhard was the name most frequently mentioned by 185 leaders in the New Age movement when Marilyn Ferguson, preparing her book on the movement, The Aquarian Conspiracy, Personal and Social Transformation in the 1980s, asked who was the most influential person in their lives. Teilhard expounded a new theology in which soul emerged as the driving force of evolution, leading to the awakening to a collective superconsciousness and a new age of the earth. Sociologist, anthropologist H. James Burks explains that Teilhard argued for, quote, the coming of a deeply moral superhumanity ennobled by the universal spirit of the cosmic Christ. 
Human consciousness, growing ever more complex and interdependent, feeds what Teilhard calls the new sphere, a layer of mind or spirit enveloping the earth. A future fourth layer, the theosphere, is envisioned by Teilhard as the culmination when the converging human spirits transcend space and matter and mystically join God Omega at the Omega point. End of quote. Calling himself a Teilhardian, Robert Mueller refers to the key turning points in his life during his 36 years at the United Nations as my Teilhardian enlightenments. He builds his speeches around Teilhard's philosophy of global evolution, of the newosphere, of metamorphosis, and of the birth of a collective brain to the human species, into which he fits the role of the UN. Jean Houston got her start in life as a young girl deeply influenced by long talks with Teilhard in New York City's Central Park. It is understandable that Mueller, Houston, and many other New Age leaders were profoundly influenced by Teilhard and became his admirers. It is incomprehensible that this is also true of some people who are looked up to as Christian leaders. Teilhardinianism and Christianity Perhaps no woman in this century has had a larger influence upon the Christianity of today than prolific best-selling author and teacher Agnes Sanford. Quoted and recommended widely by Christian leaders, Agnes Sanford was largely responsible for bringing visualization and healing of memories into the church. We'll have a great deal to say about her later, but at this point, it should be noted that much of her writing is a clear reflection of Teilhardian philosophy, which she appears to admit. After discussing the healing of the subconscious, she calls God the very life force existing in a radiation of an energy from which all things evolved, and declares that God is actually in the flowers and all the little chirping, singing things. He made everything out of himself, and somehow he put a part of himself into everything. Sanford further states, quote, If anyone doubts this, considering it an unworthy female conception and too frivolous for serious consideration, let him read The Phenomenon of Man and the Divine Milieu by the great anthropologist and prehistorian Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, end of quote. Numerous other highly influential Christian authors quote Teilhard favorably without so much as a word of caution, among them Bruce Larson, a well-respected Presbyterian leader and keynote speaker at the recent Presbyterian Congress on Renewal Convention in Dallas, Texas. Larson is a popular pastor and the author of 15 best-selling books. Oddly enough, he seems to admire Teilhard de Chardin calling him a pivotal Christian thinker of our time. A smorgasbord of confusion. In his book, The Whole Christian, Bruce Larson does make a fairly clear statement that forgiveness and redemption are possible only through God's love in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, that statement is buried within the context of what he calls a smorgasbord of answers, all of which are valid. He gives credence to everything from numerous pop psychologies to occultism, all presented as apparently beneficial for Christian living. The book is confusing at best and more likely deadly. Though he presumably is advocating the wholeness found only in Christ, Larson presents the transformation of a middle-aged man through LSD as one of the best definitions of wholeness and an excellent example of the healthiest kind of conversion. Quote, I'm happy and I simply don't think the world is going to hell as so many people seem to. I am once again very aware that there is a supreme power of which all and everything is a part. Most call this power God. I don't think it makes any difference if I call it love. I only wish that the religious forces could obtain those kinds of results. End of quote. Larson lauds a school in Boston for offering, among other subjects, yoga and belly dancing. He praises Dolores Krieger, who teaches nurses to use their hands like divining rods 
in an occult healing ritual and explains the results in terms of a force that is called prana, a Hindu term that can be transmitted from one person to another by touch. He quotes favorably numerous questionable sources from Sigmund Freud, C.G. Jung, and Abraham Maslow to Fritz Perls, Tom Harris, I'm okay, you're okay, and Eric Byrne, games people play, and declares that Carl Jung, an occultist and anti-Christian, is one of my heroes. Nevertheless, this book is highly acclaimed by a number of respected Christian leaders. When will such men realize that their careless recommendations cause many Christians to read books they might otherwise pass by and to accept false and dangerous ideas such as those we've documented from the whole Christian? The five-year plan for evangelism in the Presbyterian Church, USA, has the astonishing title, New Age Dawning. These key words are repeated dozens of times throughout the official booklet presenting this plan to the Presbyterian Church. One would like to assume that the slogan, New Age Dawning, was adopted because it seems inspiring. However, it is difficult to understand how the committee responsible could work for two years on this plan without realizing that the words New Age already had an accepted meaning that would make their adoption by a Christian denomination confusing at best. The committee called specific attention to the Presbyterian Congress on Renewal, January 7th to 11th, 1985, in Dallas, Texas. A keynote speaker at the Congress, Bruce Larson, had already gone on record concerning what he means by New Age. Quote, I had and have now a growing belief that we are in the beginning of an exciting New Age, a new age which I believe is already imminent and will change life for all people upon this globe. Inner space and interspace will become just as important, if not more important, than outer space. Mine is not an isolated hope. Carl Jung stated that in Jesus Christ, there is made possible a new rung on the ladder of evolution. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin talks about his dreams for the evolution of a new being and a new society. My dream is that we are on the verge of such a discovery, end of quote. The deification of man, the evolution of a new being and a new society that was Teilhard and Jung's dream, is certainly not what the Bible promises through the resurrection or transformation of our bodies at the return of Jesus Christ for the redeemed. Teilhard dreamed of humanity merging into God and each realizing his own godhood at the Omega Point. This belief has inspired many of today's New Age leaders. One of the major New Age networking groups is called Planetary Initiative for the World We Choose. It comes out of the United Nations and lists among its founding organizations the Club of Rome and the Association for Humanistic Psychology. David Spangler and Robert Mueller are board members. Inspired by Teilhard's belief, its logo is the Earth with the Omega sign around it. Its director, Donald Keyes, has written a book intended to be a blueprint for the New Age titled Earth at Omega. Like the title, its contents reflect Teilhardian beliefs. What Teilhard taught of course, was not unique to him, but was a restatement of the ancient lie from Eden. It is therefore not surprising that many people who have never heard of Teilhard have come under the same delusion. What is astonishing, however, is the extent to which this idea of human deification is gaining momentum within the church, and that includes many evangelical groups. Some of the leaders who are now promoting the self-deification idea as true Christianity, have been such stalwarts of the faith that one finds it impossible to believe what they are now teaching. Norman Grubb's ministry for the Lord goes back as far as 1919, when he did pioneer work among unreached tribes in the Congo with the great missionary C.T. Studd, whose daughter he later married. Grubb helped found Worldwide Evangelization Crusade and InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And some of his books are classics, such as Reese Howell's Intercessor. 
The current vehicle for his ministry is an organization called Union Life, which publishes a magazine by the same name. Norman Grubb explains what he now believes, which sounds more like Hinduism than Christianity. Quote, What we call Union Life has only one foundation, the truth that there is only one person in the universe and everything and everybody is a manifestation of him in one of his millions of manifested forms. That is oneness. If everything is he in one form or another, negative or positive, then there is nothing in the universe but he. Nothing but God exists. End of quote. This is pantheism, and it leads logically step by step into the merger of science and religion. Indeed, science is religion if all is God. It also leads to the denial of evil, sickness, and death that one finds in the rosy optimism of the mind science cults. For even what seems evil to us, including Satan, is a form of God. Thus, the only problem is our imperfect perception of reality. The next step, of course, is to realize the elusive goal of the yogis, to see ourselves as God in human form. That leads, as Union Life editor Bill Volkman has written, to living as gods without denying our humanity, recognizing that all humans are incarnations of deity, just as Jesus was. In an interview, Bill Volkman explained what that really means. Quote, Why do people constantly seek the will of God? Since I have seen this whole thing of union, I have no problem defining the will of man and the sovereignty of God as far as I'm concerned, they're exactly the same. And I no longer seek the will of God, you know. What does he want me to do? I say, what do I want to do? Exact duplicates of God? One cannot possibly investigate what is happening in both the world and the church today without becoming convinced that end-time prophecy is being uniquely fulfilled. The lie that will be believed by everyone when that deluding influence sweeps the world during the end times, is already becoming the new truth. Not only is this lie the foundation of the New Age movement, but it is being embraced within the church. One of many examples we could give is a young, dynamic pastor named Casey Treat. His new 3,500-capacity auditorium of Christian Faith Center in Seattle, Washington, is already bursting at the seams. One of Casey's favorite verses to preach from is Genesis 1.26, where God said, Let us make man in our image. Casey's interpretation is startling but clear. Quote, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost had a little conference, and they said, Let us make man an exact duplicate of us. Oh, I don't know about you, but that does turn my crank. An exact duplicate of God? Say it out loud. I'm an exact duplicate of God. The congregation repeats it a bit tentatively and uncertainly. Come on, say it. He leads them in unison. I'm an exact duplicate of God. Say it again. I'm an exact duplicate of God. The congregation is getting into it, louder and bolder, and with more enthusiasm each time they repeat it. Say it like you mean it. He's yelling now. I'm an exact duplicate of God. Yell it out loud. Shout it. They follow as he leads. I'm an exact duplicate of God. I'm an exact duplicate of God, repeatedly. When God looks in the mirror, he sees me. When I look in the mirror, I see God. Oh, hallelujah. You know, sometimes people say to me when they're mad and want to put me down, you just think you're a little God. Thank you. Hallelujah. You got that right. Who do you think you are? Jesus? Yep. Are you listening to me? Are you kids running around here acting like God's? Why not? God told me to. Since I'm an exact duplicate of God, I'm going to act like God. End of quote. A lie whose time has come. What seems most significant is the fact that only a few years ago, Christians would have gotten up and walked out on anyone who tried to suggest to them that they were gods. That no longer seems to be the case. Did anyone notice that Pastor Treat had taken a quantum leap from an image to an exact duplicate? Clearly, this is a lie whose time has come. Only a very few years ago, it was extremely difficult to convince Christians that Mormons hoped to become gods. Anyone who said that was likely to be accused of having it in for Mormons, 
and spreading lies about them. Today, many Christians themselves believe not that they are going to become gods like the Mormons, but that they already are gods like the Hindus and just need to realize it. And they even support this idea with selected Bible verses. As Bill Volkman writes, quote, It was Jesus himself who asked the Pharisees this question. Is it not written in your law that I say you are gods? John 10.34 is quoted from Psalm 82.6. But why did Jesus say that they were gods? Because all of us are gods. All humans are incarnations of deity. End of quote. Norman Grubb, Bill Volkman, and Casey Treat are by no means the only ones who are teaching that we are gods. This belief is foundational to the teachings of the positive confession movement. The reason they say we can allegedly speak the creative word and call those things which are not as though they were, just as God does, is because we are gods. Yungi Cho, Charles Capps, and other faith teachers repeatedly speak of man as being in God's class. Popular Los Angeles pastor and TV evangelist teacher Frederick Casey Price has written, I believe that God made man a God, a God under God. Charles Capps agrees. Jesus said, ye are gods. In other words, Adam was the God of the earth. Man was created to be God over the earth. Kenneth Copeland has said, You don't have a God living in you. You are one. And Robert Tilton, pastor of Word of Faith World Outreach Center in Dallas, Texas, has written, quote, You are a God kind of creature. Originally, you were designed to be as a God in this world. Man was designed and created by God to be the God of this world. Of course, man forfeited his dominion to Satan, who became the God of this world. End of quote. Ye are gods. The Bible never says that God made man a god or that he promised man that he could become a god. That was Satan's seductive promise to Eve, and it would have been meaningless if Adam and Eve had been created gods. Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 and 23 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, lest he stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden. God would not perpetuate man in his fallen state of godhood. Disobedience had brought the knowledge of good and evil, and that knowledge, forbidden by God, had destroyed the man and woman whom God had made. They had become as gods, knowing good and evil. They were now Satan's followers and children of darkness. Grasping after that knowledge was man's declaration of independence. He wanted to decide on his own what was right or wrong without having to consult God. Obviously, if everyone comes up with his own standard of good and evil, utter chaos would be the result. The idea that man can know what is right and wrong by consulting himself is a lie that caters to our pride. Man had rejected God as the personal creator who sets all standards, and in so doing, he had set himself up as his own God. Moral absolutes were out. Doing one's own thing was in. To prevent complete chaos, God indelibly imprinted moral laws in their conscience. Innocence was gone. The relationship they had known with God of complete trust and perfect love had been shattered. For the first time in their existence, Adam and Eve had the experience of a guilty conscience. That experience haunted them and continues to haunt their descendants. We have all tried to escape, ignore, adjust, or live up to conscience without success. The knowledge of good and evil has been a curse upon the human race For we, gods, can neither do the good that we should do, nor refrain from the evil that we should not do. Paul expressed the tragedy of the bondage to sin that we all have inherited from Adam and Eve. Quote, For the good that I wish, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not wish. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God for delivering me through Jesus Christ our Lord. End of quote. And that's Romans chapter 7, 
verses 19, 24, and 25. Genesis 3 teaches the following. One, man was not created as a god. Two, he became a, quote, god, end of quote, through disobedience. Three, whatever that meant, it was something that God didn't want to occur, and it was not good. Four, it caused man's expulsion from the garden, because it apparently destroyed man as God had intended him to be. God would not allow Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of life and thereby perpetuate themselves in their fallen, quote, godlike, end of quote, condition. In Psalm 82, God's judgment was pronounced against the rulers of Israel because they were acting like gods who were a law unto themselves. In verses 6 and 7, God stated, I said, you are gods. Nevertheless, you will die like men. A terrible indictment. This scripture and Jesus' quotation of it has given comfort to cultists and occultists and caused confusion among the unlearned. Mormons, for example, point to it as justification for their goal of godhood and support for their teaching that Satan told the truth when he offered godhood to Eve. Clearly, that is a false application. For Psalm 82 does not say, ye shall become gods, as Mormons hope, but ye are gods. So whatever is meant by the statement, it refers to something that humans already are, not to some new status that we will eventually attain. There is only one true God. All other gods are false and are demonic beings in rebellion against the true God. Through the fall, man had become like one of these false gods. Not only did Jesus say to the religious leaders of his day, ye are gods, but he also said, you are of your father the devil. John chapter 8 verse 44. It was a terrible indictment. Satan, who had said, I will make myself like the Most High, Isaiah 14, 14, seduced Eve into joining his rebellion against the true God. Of course, when he promised Godhood to Eve, that father of lies, John chapter 8, verse 44, had neglected to tell her that she would be a pretender, a grasper after Godhood, and a rebel against the true God and thus subject to his judgment upon all false gods. No wonder the world trembles on the brink of destruction. We now have about 4.6 billion false gods on planet Earth, each trying to rule over his own little empire in a clash of egos that won't quit. The only hope is for these gods to abdicate the thrones of their lives and come under submission to the one true God through Jesus Christ. It can only be another sign of the growing apostasy that the same verses to which Mormons and other cultists have long pointed to support their self-deification are now being used by many evangelicals as justification for their belief that being gods is something natural, normal, and good for humans. Many of the faith teachers believe that because God gave man dominion over the earth, therefore man was created a god by God. They teach that the essence of the fall was the loss of this dominion to Satan, who thereby became the god of this world, and that it is now up to man to take that dominion back from Satan and once again reign as the god over this earth. They attempt to support this from Psalm chapter 82, verse 6. What did Jesus mean? If man is not intended to be a god, then why did Jesus quote Psalm chapter 82, verse 6 to his accusers? He was doing two things. One, demonstrating that they didn't understand their own scriptures. So were in no condition to condemn him for saying that he was God. And two, showing them the depths and horror of their rebellion. Jesus was not complimenting the Jews of his day, but reminding them of their rebellion against the true God. Indeed, we are gods, just as Jesus said, but it isn't good. Through rebellion, man has broken free from God and is now a little God on his own. It is a terrible thing to be called gods, to be identified with demons who have rebelled against God and are seeking to reign in his place. The consequences of becoming gods are very clear. 
Jeremiah reminds Israel that the only true God is the creator of the universe and that he has declared that all who aspire to the status of being a God will perish. Quote, the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus shall you say to them, the gods that did not make the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens, end of quote. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10 and 11. The lake of fire, we are told, was not prepared for man, but for the devil and his angels. However, we consign ourselves to the same fate when we not only join Satan's rebellion, as all of us have done, but when we refuse to admit the sin of masquerading as God's. If we are to be saved, then we must make a full confession of the real nature of our sin, that we have tried to play God. Instead of that, a positive confession is being preached. Confess your healing. Confess your prosperity. Confess your dominion over this earth. Confess your divine right. Command God to heal and bless. Such confession is not the repentance that qualifies for the forgiveness which God offers by virtue of the fact that Jesus Christ has paid the full penalty for our rebellion. This positive confession is a renewed declaration that we want the same godhood Satan offered to Eve. This aspiration after godhood is an ambition that has become apparently incurable, apart from Christ, obsession for the entire human race. It is at the heart of all occultism and shamanism and is the essence of the human potential movement and the religion of the Antichrist. It is sweeping the world today as part of the delusion that is preparing us for this coming world dictator. And the same delusion has been entering the church as a key element in the growing apostasy. self deification delusion for today. The noted historian Arnold Toynbee, after studying civilizations across the whole span of history, concluded that self-worship was the paramount religion of mankind although it appeared in various guises. Man, that is self, is the god of atheistic humanism. Of course, he is not god in the classical biblical sense of the creator who made everything out of nothing and is separate and distinct from his creation. This true god is denied in the religion of Antichrist, as we have already seen, so that self may be enthroned in his place. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Humanism, as in Mormonism, unity, religious science, Hinduism, and other New Age philosophies, man has become God, one, through an evolutionary process, and two, by mastering the forces inherent in nature or the cosmos. This was the Superman of Nietzsche and Hitler. It is only within the past 25 years, however, that this obsession has become the popular religion of the masses. Historian Herbert Schlossberg has said, quote, Exalting mankind to the status of deity therefore dates from the furthest reaches of antiquity, but its development into an ideology embracing the masses is a characteristic trait of modernity, end of quote. It should be added that its development into an ideology embracing the masses and its spreading in the church would seem to be a clear fulfillment of prophecy and a solemn indication that the second coming of Christ could be very near. For those who reject the positive confession point of view, Satan cleverly puts the same lie in a package that will appeal to them, the pseudoscientific language of psychology. The magician's deep silk hat, from which Christian intellectuals have been persuaded they can pull forth magic mind powers is called the subconscious. This supposedly holds the key to miraculous healings of body, soul, spirit, mind, and emotions. Satan reinforces his promise of godhood with the lie that we have all we need within us. If we only know how to get in touch with our true self, then we can tap into this power. The entire smorgasbord of therapies being encouraged by some Christian leaders is being sampled by Christians in one form or another, either out in the secular world or inside the church. 
Much of this influence has come into the church through Christian psychology and the pseudo-psychologies of inner healing and healing of memories. The common denominator is self. Not everyone would identify with the desire to become a god, but that is the lie that hooked not only Eve, but her descendants. And to whatever extent we seek to use God to bring about our will, pander to our self-centered desires, or in any way are afraid or unwilling to surrender wholly to God's will, to that extent we are exalting ourselves to the position of God's, whether we call it that or not. The teaching is spreading that we don't ask God, but command him to give us all that is our divine right to possess and enjoy. Whatever the label on the package, the product inside is the same old satanic ploy. The answer is within ourselves. We can do it if we only learn the laws and principles that apply and put them into operation by faith. The goal is always to reward self in some way. Though called by many names, it is still the lie that the Bible prophesies will become the new truth upon which Antichrist's kingdom will be built and which will eventually prove to be a foundation of sand. From this root of delusion, the entire tree of sorcery has sprung forth and blossomed and is now bearing the evil fruit that is so greedily being devoured by this generation. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to the BereanCall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is TheBereanCall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24 7. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back.